On the line with us is Professor David Graber. Uh, Dr. Graber is a professor of anthropology at the London School of Economics. His last book, Debt, The First 5,000 Years, my recollection is we had him on the program about that. And his latest is uh, a word you can't say on the air, uh, but we typically abbreviate that word with BS. So we'll say BS Jobs is the title of the book. He has, his writing has appeared in the New York Times, Harper's, The Guardian, The Baffler. Uh, you can tweet him at David Graeber, G-R-A-E-B-E-R. -E -E and uh, his uh, website, no, I don't have a website for him. So David, welcome, wel welcome back to the program. Mm -hmm. Hello, thanks for having me. Yeah, great to have you with us. So uh, tell us, what is, you know, BS Jobs, what are you talking about here? Well, it's kind of been discovered when, uh, I'm kind of a stranger to academic profession and the life. I don't come from that sort of background. And one thing I kept noticing was I keep running into people who, when you ask them what they do for a living, they're kind of apologetic or evasive, and they, well, they say nothing really. And, you know, if you ask them, if you follow up, maybe get them a little drunk at a party, you know, they'll admit that they actually mean literally nothing. They don't do anything. They, they have maybe work too two hours a week where they have a job which they think is just completely pointless or meaningless. And, and I wondered, you know, how common is that really? I wrote a little article about it, which is almost a bit of a joke. This is back in 2013. Um, maybe this is the reason we're not all working 20 hour weeks, you know? Maybe, maybe they've just kind of made up jobs to keep us busy. And I was just shocked by the response. Um, I, I wrote it in a rather obscure publication, Strike Magazine, a new magazine had just started, and and it just went crazy. Like within weeks, it had been translated into 12, 13 different languages, uh, millions and millions of hits, the server kept crashing. I realized that this is a lot more common than I thought. And ultimately, people made a, did a survey. Um, YouGov did one at first, and they did another one in Holland. They discovered that somewhere between 37 to 40 percent of all people in jobs say that, you know, were their job to disappear, it would really make no difference, that they make no meaningful contribution to the world at all. Now, let me, let me give you a counterpoint to that, David, because and, and, I, I suspect that there's more to this than just the job itself. My dad worked in a tool and die shop for 40 years. I used to go down there after school every day when I was in elementary school and hang out with him and the guys. And um, these, this was a unionized shop. So every single one of the, and it was like a 14 man, you know, it was a small, small tool and die shop. And then there was one guy who did nothing, but he was the janitor. He swept the floors and things, but they were all in the union. They were all making what in today's dollars would probably be 60 or $70,000 a year. And mm. they all had good incomes. They all could take vacations. They all bought a new car every other year. They all had full health care and retirement. And they loved their work, even though all they were doing was running lathes and blanchards and things, you know, grinding metal all day long um, in ways that would seem meaningless. But well, they not only found meaning, meaning out of this, but, but when my dad retired, he kept going back there. And, and that was not uncommon. A lot of these guys, after they retired, they would still show up and have lunch with the guys. Well, sure. I mean, but that's not a meaningless job. That's the very definition of the opposite. I mean, you're making stuff that people obviously want and need. And when I'm talking about meaningless, I'm saying, like, if this job didn't exist, nobody would care. Um, if there were for example, machine tools, we'd be in trouble. Everybody for, knew that. For example, that's, you, that's you mean like, I, I, what kind of job are you talking You mean like being a Walmart greeter? Well, I mean, I'm talking about, okay, I actually um, did a survey. I, I, I asked people to s create an email account, and I said, just send me your most pointless and, and idiotic jobs. Um, and I got about well, a few hundred um, responses, which I then categorized. And, and basically what we're talking about is clerical, administrative, managerial jobs, uh, supervisory jobs, so like a lot of people said, well, I'm, I'm middle management, my job is to supervise people who have no need for supervision. Um, a lot of people are kind of flunky jobs or they or receptionists for places that don't actually need receptionists. Some places do need receptionists, but other places, you know, they just sit there all day, maybe they get one phone call. Um, they're there as an ornament because if you don't have a receptionist, you're not taken seriously. Uh, but, but the thing that really struck me was just how many of them there were. You know, everybody knows there are a few jobs like that, but this was just crazy. There, there, seem, there are thousands and thousands and thousands, actually millions of people uh, who, you know, labor in the secret knowledge that, that their jobs are just completely pointless and unnecessary. Do you, and, and you don't see a connection between 
between the job and or between the, the feeling of pointlessness and the level of pay and benefits? Um, there's a negative relation. Um, the, the more useful your work is nowadays this is definitely true because it was like you know well-paid union jobs are less and less of course you know nowadays the more useful your job the more your job helps other people in some way whether that's you know by providing care if you're a nurse or, or making products that people actually do want to buy um the less they'll pay you this is this is very clear um the most useless jobs are almost invariably the ones that are the best paid and there are a few examples of doctors. Um, you know, if you're a union plumber, you still make good money. Of useful jobs that are well paid, but it's really the exception nowadays. Interesting. How, how is this different from 50 or 100 years ago? Well, um, I think we have a false narrative of what happened. You know, the way people talk about it is, well, there's been a rise of a, of, of a service economy. You know, farming collapsed and then industry collapsed, and now we're all just selling services to each other. The way they make it sound, you know, basically everybody's employed feeding each other sushi or uh, repairing one another's iPhones, and giving each other haircuts. But this isn't actually true. Actually, if you look at the the real numbers, about 20% of the population is now, or the workforce, is now doing actual service work and always has been. I mean, it's been about the same. It fluctuates a little bit over time, but basically it's been about 20% for the last 100 years. So that's not what changed. What makes it look like services are going up is actually clerical, administrative, and supervisory sort of jobs, management. There's this, an enormous efflorescent of these sort of pointless office jobs. Hmm. And these are not considered service jobs? Well, I mean, they're categorized as such. You know, if you're an IT servicer, you're like running the database or writing articles for an in-house magazine and a corporation or, you know, all these kind of things which HR, you know, I guess that's categorized as service uh, in most of the, uh, when people talk about the rise of the service economy, but it's not really service. It's, it's a different thing. Yeah. You, you, uh, you talk about, and this is from the dust jacket of your book, nurses, bus drivers, musicians, and landscape gardeners provide true value. And what it says about us as a society when we look down upon them, how is that part of the dynamic? Well, that's the interesting thing. It, it is, it's not just that the more useful your work, the less you get paid for it. It's that a lot of people seem to feel that's right. That's the way, I mean, nobody feels it's right when it happens to them. Right. Um, so if I'm working in social services and I'm, I'm in so much debt and paid so little that I can't feed my family, I think that's wrong and unfair. And of course, I'm right. Uh, but when you talk about society as a whole, people will say these crazy things. It's like, well, you know, we wouldn't want teachers to be paid too much because you don't want people who are mainly interested in money to be teaching our kids. Or, or people will say things like, well, you know, if people have to make sacrifices, it, you know, it might as well be the people who are already involved in, in, in these, you, well, they, they don't quite say it, but, but for example, here in the UK, um, they seem to think that uh, after the banking crisis, who had to take pay cuts? Not the bankers, right? They're the ones who caused the problem. But the government didn't seem to find any problem leaving them of all their money. But on the other hand, suddenly ambulance uh, workers or, or you know, the guy in the train station who gives you information, all these people are actually providing helpful uh, services. Those are the guys who have to get pay cuts. It's got to the point here in the UK where there are full-time nurses uh, who are actually dependent on food banks who are, you know, have to have to go to charity to, to eat because right. they're not paying them enough. And and the government, you know, cheers when they like, cut, the, um, cut the salaries for these guys who are actually useful and no one would deny it, um, has no problem with, with, with hedge fund managers like still making off like bandits. And somehow they, you know, they remain in power. It's right. not considered an outrage. So there seems to be this idea that people who are public spirited should be the ones who are making the sacrifices and shouldn't be paid as much. Right, and that's an argument that's used against public employee unions as well. So, uh, yeah. David, or, we or, have or, just we have just a minute here until we're going to hit a break. What is the solution to this? Ah, well, I mean, there's various ones. We could massive reduction of working hours would be one solution, but my preferred one at the moment, I actually, uh, I'm going to make a case for universal basic income. Okay, go for it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. All right. You want me to do that now? Yeah, please. Uh, if you okay. can do it in 60 seconds. Um, well, uh, I, I'd say it like this. Um, nobody does these kind of jobs for any reason other than the money. So if they already had the money, they wouldn't do them. Um, I mean, we have this idea that people want something for nothing. And one of the things that, that 
you know, the very misery of these people and, and these kind of BS jobs shows is that this is not the case. I mean, these are guys who are given money for nothing, and they're you know, very unhappy. This, the amazing thing is just how disturbed, and, and they're they're even more unhappy because they can't figure don't feel they have a right to be unhappy. So you don't you don't think that uh, you know if a BS job causes unhappiness and then there's pay associated with it that if you give people the same pay with no job no BS job that they won't be equally unhappy. Well, if they don't do anything with their life, but the thing about a BS job is that you have to go there and pretend to work. Right. If you just if they just gave you the same money and said do something useful or interesting to you, or that well, you care about. Would do something useful. I mean, you know, I mean, a few people would slack off, but you know, most people actually want to be doing something with themselves. That's why they're so miserable when they're not allowed to. Yeah. Um, and and you know, maybe some of them would do stupid things. And this is the usual criticism, right? Well, okay, maybe um, they would do something they think is useful, but what? Maybe society wouldn't. Maybe they'll all go off and you know, right. try to like. No, I get it, but but odds are they won't. David, or, David, we're hitting the break here. We're out of time. David Graeber, the book is BS Jobs, only BS is spelled out. A Theory is the subtitle. David, thanks so much for being with us.